Bom dia. Bom dia a todos e a todas. Vamos dar início aos nossos trabalhos, nossa conferência. Como o Gabbard já foi apresentado inúmeras vezes, né, nós não vamos reler todo o currículo, o enorme currículo dele, para a gente ganhar tempo para poder conversar com ele no final. Só dizer que ele é um, é um grande expoente, talvez um dos maiores nomes da psiquiatria dinâmica no mundo atualmente. Então, é um grande prazer. Como diretor administrativo, tenho que dizer que é uma grande honra que ele seja, então, tenha sido nomeado nosso membro honorário aqui do CELC. Um pequeno recado sobre o almoço. Devido à pre... grande procura ontem em relação ao almoço, o restaurante está ainda mais preparado, se preparou melhor para o almoço de hoje, então fiquem tranquilos, vamos ter um bom almoço. E uma notícia de primeira mão, perguntei para o Dr. Gabbard se eu podia, poderia falar em público, ele disse que sim, que ele já está pensando seriamente em vir novamente daqui a dois anos na próxima jornada. Então... Pode ir, né? Agradecemos imensamente. Por favor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Felix, for a very nice introduction, and I'm glad to see all of you uh, here this morning. Uh, my topic is a, a crucial one for the future of what we do. Um, what, once um, William Osler, the, the famous internist from Canada, said, it is more important to know the person with the illness than the illness the person has. I presented this quotation at a meeting, and one of my colleagues in the audience said, no, 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 that's not Osler. Osler copied it from Hippocrates. So I checked, Hippocrates says, it's more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. Now, I did not know Hippocrates personally, <laughs> even though I'm very old. And so then I talked to a Spanish colleague in Madrid, as a personal friend, and he said, you know, in Spain we have no hay enfermedades sino enfermos. Pretty much the same idea. He said, this is a universal idea. So this is one of the things I want to talk about today, that we treat people, we don't just treat a disease, and this is at the heart of what those of us in mental health do. <clears throat> Now, there has been a movement called personalized medicine, uh, which sounds good because it sounds like you're going to keep the person in the medicine. But there have been many critics of this approach because there is a kind of uh, biological reductionism in it. And, um, It's a medical model that proposes customizing treatment to the individual patient, but they focus mainly on the use of genomic information to personalize the approach. And I'm suggesting we, while that's good, of course, to have genomic information, we need to broaden what we are trying to do. There has been um, a backlash to this movement towards personalized medicine by science, scientists who are critics and 
in Science Magazine, as I said yesterday, the most prestigious journal in the United States, Horwitz and colleagues made the following critique. The movement is having exactly the opposite effect than it intends. The sociocultural, the clinical, and environmental features that contribute to the illness and create the person have been neglected. So it's not only the genome, it's where does this person live? Who is in the person's culture? What sort of relationships do they have? We have to keep that in the total picture. <clears throat> now, these critics, Horwitz and his group, have said, you know, look at other diseases that are uh, extraordinarily prevalent. Cardiovascular, you know, for example. Diet is important. Behaviors are important. Stress, culture. All of these things may be far more important than the genomic material, or at least similarly important. So these critics suggest what is needed to complement the power of genomics is an emphasis on personal attributes of patients and their environments. Now, this seems obvious, but I believe we are going through an era of biological and genomic reductionism. It is easier to not think about the person when you're going through the halls of a hospital and looking at the disease on the chart but I'm saying we, as psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health people, should be thinking far beyond that. We have to take into account the brain whenever we talk about the mind or the person. Because we don't want to go to the other direction and be naive and say the brain doesn't matter. One of my uh, long-standing goals as an educator has been to integrate brain and mind, as you know. So let us look at neural networks as a starting point. We must keep in mind always that genomic expression is highly influenced by the environment. There's abundant evidence to show that. So you can't leave out environment. The experience that you have as a person is going to determine what neural networks are laid down in your brain. And we have to be considering that as part of our work with a the patient. These neural networks are the brain correlate of our self-image the expectations of how others will interact with you. We would say things like internal object relations are embedded in neural networks. Now, we all have representations of people, objects, situations, and we, as therapists, work a great deal with a representation of, of an individual when they're talking about their suffering and why they've come to see us. We have to remember that these are stored in the matrix of connections and the synapses. And, you know, we have an expression in English, neurons that fire together, wire together. So if they're firing together, they form a connection, a network that tells us who the person is. It shapes the person. Now, here is another problem with uh, biological or genomic reductionism. Personal identity does not necessarily overlap with genomic identity. You know, the news often likes to tell stories on television about two 
brothers who were separated at birth. They were twins, you know. They were adopted and you never, they never see each other until they're 30 years old. And when they're 30, they meet up again and they say, oh, we both married a woman named Alice. We both drive a BMW. And we like the same classical music. So all of this is genetic. And this is on television and everybody says, boy, those scientists really have figured all this out, you know. That's just great. It's all genes. Now, there have been critics of this, uh, such as Alex Moran. Um, and and the, the point of this is that those are the cases that get on television. Now, there are also identical twins who have completely different interests. And, you know, uh, Moran's point is monozygotic twins with identical genomes can be highly distinct. And they've studied this in London, and they also see twins separated at birth. And then they meet up 30 years later, and one of them likes Beethoven, and the other one likes Willie Nelson and country music, you know? <laughs> and one of them drives a truck, and the other one drives a sports car. And one of them is married to a woman who is, has a totally different personality than the other uh, man's uh, wife. And so that uh, we can't make these overly simplified assumptions about genes versus uh, environment or behavior. So this makes the person much more complicated. And I think in our field, we love to oversimplify because there is such complexity. And I'm saying today, let's try to avoid oversimplifying a complex uh, set of problems. Now, when I was in um, medical school, and Hippocrates had died, as I said, by that time. <laughs> there was an old book that was a very uh, influential book called The Person by a Yale professor called T uh, Ted Litz. And this was sort of your basic textbook in psychiatry. You'd read about the evolution of the person. Now, we don't hear that very much anymore. The, the person tends to get sidestepped as though that's not something that psychiatrists and other mental health professionals need to know. Now, in preparing this talk, I decided to look up the definition of person because I wasn't really sure how we define it. What the Oxford English Dictionary said an individual human being, that wasn't terribly helpful. <laughs> Now, this, this one, the second one is interesting, the actual self or being of an individual. But again, we get bogged down, what do they mean by self or being? So let's look at, let's look at this term self in light of philosophy, science, literature. Here's a, a quote from Hume. When I, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. And he says, I never catch myself at any time without a perception and never can observe anything but the perception. If anyone upon serious and unprejudiced Reflection thinks he has a different notion of himself. I must confess I can reason no longer with him. So he was taking a hard line there. Um, this is, for those of you who have read James Joyce, this is sort of the problem described by Leopold Bloom in the book, that he can't exactly identify himself because the consciousness is always involved with perceiving something, the act of perception. Here's another problem with the term self, if we think about it. Self is subject, but also object. 
Very important principle in psychiatry. <clears throat> think of this statement here. I think of myself. All of us do that every day. But here we're distinguishing the I, the thinker, from the self, the representation of who we are. Self as a phenomenal I of philosophy, you know, the I that's observing everything, and then self as a representation. You know, how we think of ourselves. And, you know, one of the most important aspects of doing psychodynamic therapy is helping the patient understand what self-representation they have built up inside of them that tells them who they are and that allows them to navigate in the world. And that self is often filled with self-deception. Now, there's a philosophical question, how can the self be both subject and object? And would we say it's the contents of consciousness that constitute the self? So here's some intriguing questions. Let's proceed with our study now of what self is. <clears throat> memory comes into it. And memory is the cornerstone of self-continuity. This is one of my paintings I did in the, my spare time. That's a joke. That's just a joke. <laughs> and, and there's uh, self-continuity is, is, you know, incredibly important in terms of memory. And uh, the self as memory can be defined as the aggregate of personal memories and the social personas associated with them. And one of my favorite filmmakers, Luis Bunuel, once said, the self is memory. There's a a lot of uh, uh, work to back that up because we all have a continuous sense of self. And here's one of the most interesting things to me in my many years doing therapy and analysis is how that narrative is shaped. The patient leaves out certain things, emphasizes other things. So the self that is memory is a self filled with all kinds of distortions and self-deceptions to make oneself look better to others and, and to oneself. The cortex is wired by memories. So, you know, we are, the, the memories are internalized in, in the cortex and hardwired there so that we start to build up a version of the self that will have special connotation to us, but maybe the other person doesn't see us in the same way. And, you know, uh, we, we all do that to some extent. We have to keep focusing on the way the narrative of the self is transformed to make us be able to live with ourselves. So far, we haven't talked about conscious self versus unconscious self. So let's spend some time on this also. This is from Thomas Nagel, the philosopher. He talks about the hidden self. I may understand and be able to apply the term I to myself without knowing what I really am. And I think this is probably universal. We have an idea about who we are, but other people might see us differently. So, you know, we, we still use the term I, but it's in a very loose, very broad way. <clears throat> we all know as psychodynamic clinicians that aspects of the self are repressed, are split off and disavowed because they are unacceptable. So... One of the most important things, I, I teach this to my residents and I teach this to my patients. We are all masters of self-deception. We have to shape a self that we can live with, that we find compatible with our value system. And so we tend to split off, repress, 
those aspects we don't want to be a part of us. And of course, our journey as therapists is to find these things in someone that they don't like, and they often get projected into the therapist or analyst. <clears throat> the sad story about all of this is that we actually don't know ourselves very well. And one of the things that is so helpful in clinical work is when you are seeing an individual to get collateral information from family members and friends when you can, because they often paint a very different picture of what the person thinks about himself. <clears throat> now, to for, I'm trying to convey the complexity of this whole term self, and I think multiplicity of the self is another area that we have to look at. We are not one thing. We are, our self is, a, is a, a multiplicity of selves that are somewhat integrated, but not completely. This is Galen Strauss and another philosopher. There simply isn't any I or self that goes on through the waking day, even though there's obviously an I or self at any given time. So that I the, that we think of as the self is changing in the course of a day, depending on what's going on. Stephen Mitchell, who is a, a very uh, famous psychoanalyst in the United States who died at the age of 50 while he was exercising, and it was a real tragedy because he was quite a genius and developed kind of the relational school of psychoanalysis. He said, a, a paradox of psychoanalytic work, that is, patients learn to tolerate the multiple facets of themselves, of the self, they begin to experience themselves as more coherent. This is a very good idea, I think, and one that makes intuitive sense, that if you are, are trying to fully understand yourself, you don't put just one corner of the psyche out for your consideration. You look at all of your aspects. Some of them are positive, some are not so positive, but the, the complex whole is who the person is to a large extent. Buddha, who is not a psychoanalyst, as far as I know, <laughs> said, the self is only a conventional name given to a set of elements. You know, we say the self very glibly as though it's one thing, but we're really talking about a whole set of uh, aspects of ourselves. <clears throat> the other thing that we have to uh, realize is that the self, as we know it, is dependent on context. And a, a common sense idea is that we are different with different people. And you, you, if, you're, if your mother and you are having a talk, you'll have one persona. And then if your boss comes in and wants to talk, you will behave differently. If you see your three-year-old son, you'll, you'll talk to him in a different way and, and show a different aspect. And, of course, one of the great uh, lessons of Beyond and the, his group theories is that the, a group itself has tremendous influence on how you come across to others and how you are shaped and that we take on projections from others in, the, in that context. <clears throat> Daniel Dennett's another brilliant philosopher who said the selves are not independently existing soul pearls, but artifacts of the social processes that create us. Different aspects of the self are evoked by different figures in different settings in the environment. That's happening every day. <clears throat> now, when we talk about self-development, we have to include culture. And too often in psychoanalytic and psychotherapeutic writing, that's left out. But the self-development is steeped in culture. Um, one of the uh, uh, excellent novelists who's looked at this is Gish Jen, a Chinese author who is... Uh, 
beautiful writer, and she makes the point, Asian culture is not centered in self-experience. And many Western people can't quite grasp that idea. In other words, there is an interdependent self, and it's created by uh, all of the people in your family, in your immediate setting, and the parenting that you have. All of that focuses on social context. And uh, one uh, Chinese therapist told me that in work with his patients, he had to keep that in mind that the self can't be extracted from the family and the, and the cultural milieu. But the, the problem is, as we go back to my original question, you know, who is the person, the person with the illness that you are treating? The problem is the self is not the same thing as the person. Sorry to disappoint you, but we have to get into some more detail to figure this out. There is self as experienced versus self as observed by others. And, you know, here's a, um, here's a very interesting and unsolvable question. If um, someone sees you on a videotape, does that person have a truer sense of who you are than if you are sitting quietly in a room by yourself thinking about who you are? You know, is the objective view more accurate than the internal view? <clears throat> now, if you see yourself on video, everybody hates it. <laughs> you know, I've shown, I, I, I videotape residents and when they're interviewing patients to teach about their interviewing technique. And I think 99% of the residents, when they see themselves on video, say, I don't look like that. And the class says, oh, yes, you actually do look like that. <laughs> and the resident says, no, no, I see myself in the mirror. I don't look like that. that the camera is bad. I says, no, no, you do. And, and then they say, my voice doesn't sound like that. And everyone says, yeah, you're, that's how your voice sounds. And the, and the protesting resident says, no, I hear my voice every day. I can hear it right now with my ears. I don't sound like that. People say, yeah, I'm afraid you do. You do sound like that. <laughs> and then, then they end up with, oh, I hate myself, you know. <laughs> if I really look like that and sound like that, I hate myself. So there, there's something about, you know, getting a kind of objectified view of yourself that people don't like. And what's beautiful about this is it means that we have all shaped an alternative version of ourselves that doesn't look like the guy on the video, you know. So we all do this to a large extent. So what are the conclusions so far in my lecture this morning? We don't see ourselves like others see us, no matter how hard we try. Now, this is a reason that we mental health professionals stay in business, you know. We can see people differently than they see themselves, and we give them feedback and help them understand what they're leaving out. Now, this is my basset hound. His name is Ralphie. <coughs> and from the outside, he looks very sad. <laughs> but what you can't see is his tail is wagging, okay? So that's his happy look, <laughs> you see. <laughs> and there is a, um, a, an important point that we can't perfectly see by external appearance how someone is feeling. <laughs> From the outside, others cannot always see how we feel inside. They really don't know because the observer is projecting things, too, on the other person. This happens in therapy two ways. We both project things onto the other person. <clears throat> so knowing who the person is requires an integration of the inside and the outside perspective. Um, to me, that would be a central goal of psychotherapy. 
you are helping this person integrate their own inside perspective with how others are seeing them, including me, the therapist. I would be saying, I see you somewhat differently than you describe yourself. And I would try to tactfully explain what I see versus what they see. <clears throat> now, to be non-reductionistic, we integrate the inside and the outside. And I think a very important principle of therapy lies in this. Arnold Goldberg, an analyst in Chicago who was a disciple of Heinz Kohut, made an important point. He said, the therapist has to oscillate between empathic attunement with the person and their inner world and an objective view of how the patient comes across to others and affects others. So you go back and forth. And uh, I'll give you an example. One man who continuously complained about his mother because he would ask his mother questions. This is a, you know, a, a middle-aged man. And he would ask his mother about something, and she would say, I have tried to raise you the best I can. I don't want to be criticized. I don't want you to keep going back about what I did wrong as a mother. And, and he would be furious. He said, I'm trying to have a dialogue with my mother. She won't engage in it. It's like she says, what is past is past. And I would say empathically, that must hurt. It must feel terrible when you try to reconnect with your mother and look at what you have been through in your childhood. And she basically puts her hand up and says, no. He says, it's terrible. And, you know, I keep going after her at least once a month when I'm visiting and saying, can we talk about this? She always says no. And then I would say, I'm, now, I'm, uh, that my first empathic comment was the, the inner world, and I'm taking an outside perspective. And I said, you know, have you thought, though, that you make it worse by nagging your mother every month when you're talking with her, sort of demanding that she do something that she doesn't want to do? This seems to undermine your relationship with your mother even worse. So... You know, first the empathy and then kind of an outside perspective of helping the patient see how they're coming across. This is, I think, a real important principle in therapy. Now, what are our current problems in the field about the person? Last night, Sydney and I uh, talked about the personality disorders and what has happened in the field that in the DSM-5, the axis 2 was taken out, and I would say that has both positive and negative implications. One of the things that was positive is axis 2 personality forced clinicians to at least consider the dimension of personality instead of just making a quick diagnosis and then uh, moving on and not thinking about who the person is. But what happened in many, many hospitals in the United States was access to had been ignored, and they would write deferred, meaning, you know, they're, they're writing up a chart for the first meeting of the patient, and they're basically saying, we haven't thought about personality yet. We'll defer that and do that later. So it often didn't work very well to have an access to. And that, the deferred was the most common use of it. And why was Access 2 created? This is an interesting story. One, um, one time I was at a meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, and uh, we were talking about personality disorders. And Bob Spitzer, who was the originator of the DSM system, was in the audience. So he heard me say that Axis 2 has not worked out very well because it's not used and it's deferred. And afterwards, Spitzer came up to me after the meeting and said, 
Glenn, don't you understand? I created Axis 2 for you psychoanalytic types so you would have patients with personality problems to, to specialize in treatment, you know. And I said, well, thank you, Bob, but it hasn't worked out that well because most people are not using the Axis 2. And uh, he, you know, was quite concerned because he feels that leads psychiatry to be less psychotherapeutic if you don't continue to think about the personality of the, the patient. Now, here's what happened when I was a full-time professor at Baylor. I would have a case conference, and the psychiatric resident would give me a beautiful Axis I diagnosis of depression or bipolar or what, and then I said, what about anything else? And the resident would say, I think the patient has some Axis II stuff. <laughs> now, Axis II stuff is always a bad thing, you know. <laughs> There's nothing good to have that. It usually meant, you know, the person's obnoxious, difficult, angry, manipulative, or otherwise unpleasant, you know. So it became a pejorative term. And, you know, it, it's true that um, in psychiatry, personality disorder is kind of like an insult. You know, a lot of people hear it as a bad thing to have. Um, it's synonymous with being antisocial, demanding, unpleasant, or difficult. Now, the thing that I always would say to residents is some personality disorders, such as obsessive-compulsive, are diagnosable in people standing next to you right here on rounds, you know, in white coats or hospital rounds. Many, many physicians have really problematic obsessive-compulsive personality disorder. You know, and they, they can't get as much done because of it. And it's interesting because when I was in my first day of medical school, the chairman of medicine said to all the first-year students, Compulsiveness is the most important quality for a physician. You check a diagnosis and recheck it. And all of us were taking notes and underlining it in our yellow underliner. Say, okay, compulsiveness, most important thing. So I'll, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll be compulsive, so I'll be a good doctor. <laughs> but, you know, th this is also sort of accepted within some cultures, and it's part of a personality disorder. Um, the, the other thing is that the distinction between Axis 2 and Axis 1 raised awareness of disorders, but it, it, it kind of, um, Axis 2 became a pejorative adjective, a bad thing to have. Um, and then the main point for my lecture today is that it led some to think that the person was not relevant. You just figure out some isolated diagnosis, not who the person is. <clears throat> Of course, a personality disorder is not the same thing as the person. So let's, let's try to get more specific. It, as you've seen, and as so far what I've said, it, it's not easily categorized. It's hard to say what the, who the person is. And a psychodynamic diagnosis is about the person. What's unique and idiosyncratic and a, and a complex amalgam of many different variables that extend uh, in different directions. One of the uh, things I've done for this presentation is try to tease out certain determinants of the person, and I realize I'm being a little bit artificial here because there is overlap, but I think it's helpful to think broadly about it that part of the person is the subjective experience of oneself based on a unique historical narrative filtered through the lens of specific meanings, you know, and Different events can create different reactions in siblings in the same family so that, you know, there is um, uh, that subjective experience is a major part of it and a set of conscious and unconscious conflicts, defenses, representations, and self-deceptions. How we defend ourselves as we grow uh, and think about who we are compared to other people, we have a, we have a, a skewed version of that a set of internalized interactions with others that are unconsciously reenacted, creating impressions in others. So this is sort of you know, our object relations, what we've internalized. 
and then our physical characteristics, which we have to take into account. If you are six feet, eight inches tall, you have a strikingly different physical um, persona than someone who is five feet, five inches tall. And much is attributed to someone who is very, very tall. The same thing with obesity or being very skinny. These are, are physical characteristics that immediately lead to assumptions about the person. Almost anyone who has, who's slender, you know, jealous people will say, oh, well, she must have an eating disorder, you know. And this, this is pathologized, in other words. Now, our, our brain, that's a product of genes and interaction with the environment, forces and the creation of neural networks by, you know, cumulative experience so that whatever experience you have will, will certainly shape who you are. And then, as I mentioned earlier, cultural, religious, and social affiliations. You are part of a culture. You're embedded in a system of the way people think about religion, the way they think about uh, culture, and, of course, our cognitive style and capacities. Um, someone with an IQ of 150 has a very different sense of a self than someone with an IQ of 80, and we often don't like to make those distinctions, but it, it uh, goes a long way to shape who the person is. <clears throat> I want to talk about a case example to show how... Um, I try to use this in, in uh, therapy. And this is a case of a woman who was 44 who was a teacher. And uh, she came to treatment because of recurrent depression, feelings of self-loathing, and a wish to improve her sexual desire in her marriage. And she would say, my husband is a very decent man but I have absolutely no desire, and I think it hurts his feelings, and I, I want to try to, to work on that. Now, she would pretend to enjoy sex because the husband was a good man, but she never had any sexual desire at any time in her life, and she realized that had created problems for her. I wanted to say something now about how the patient comes into the office and what you observe as a clinician. So in my office, there were, um, you know, I always have the chairs. I situate the chairs like this. Some of you may have seen this in my textbook on psychotherapy. And this way, you know, you don't have obligatory eye contact. If you sit in a 45-degree angle, you can look over when you want to and look back. So the patient doesn't feel like you're glaring at them. So I assumed, like most patients, she'd sit on one of these. Well, she walked by both chairs. And then she came to my analytic couch. And she wanted to sit on the couch. Not lie down, but sit. So uh, she said, is it okay if I sit here, I say, sure. I say, you sit wherever you want to sit. I said, what made you choose the couch? She said, well, do you know anything about the Hopi Indians? I said, not very much. She said, the Hopi Indians have a saying. Everyone finds the seat in the room that is most suited to them. So I said, thanks, I didn't know that aphorism. And uh, I said, so that couch is most seated for you. She said, yeah. And I said, well, it keeps you at a pretty far distance from me, but that's okay if you're comfortable with that. Now, this, this was an important point because in her life, she had an incestuous relationship with her father from 6 to 12. And uh, it was heartbreaking to hear it. She would describe her, her dad would come into her bed at night, have intercourse with her, and she would say, I would float above 
the bed, and I would look down, and I would see my father, but he was with another person, not me. This is what people who dissociate and depersonalize do, you know. You say, he's having sex with that girl down there, but I'm up here. It's kind of the out-of-body experience. And she tried to continue to use that as a defense, and she said he stopped when he was 12, and she started having menstrual periods because he was afraid that she would get pregnant. As I say, it's a heartbreaking story, and it's difficult to listen to. But she also developed a conviction that she was a thoroughly bad person. Like, the fact that she went along with what her dad was doing made her feel that she herself was bad because she, went, she cooperated with it. Now, um, one of the things, well, let me, before I get into this, let me, let me say one other thing about it. Um, she went to a Catholic school, and when she was in third grade, she went to one of the nuns that she particularly liked, and she told her what her father was doing. And the nun said, you must never mention that again to anyone. Don't ever say that. Then she felt even worse. She felt humiliated, and she felt, I must be really bad. Because the nun says, I can't ever talk about that. And so one of the things that happened is, with this terrible self-esteem, she, you know, approached sex in a way that made her highly conflicted. And she also had absolutely no sensation in the genital area. And there's some research I wanted to share about this. And this is research by Heim et al. and the Nemiroff group. Uh, what we know now, this is from an extensive study of children who were sexually abused is that exposure to childhood sexual abuse is specifically associated with cortical thinning in the homunculus, you know, the, where, where the body is represented in the brain. At, at the genital uh, level, it's, there's a cortical thinning, so there's no sensation in many of these people who've been abused of any kind of sexual feeling. The theory is that neural plasticity of this kind, changing in the brain, may protect the child from the sensory processing of specific abuse experiences. So it's, it's adaptive if you're seven years old and being abused. But as you get older, you have no sexual response. It's, it deadens the sexual response. So this is one of the ways of understanding what she was experiencing, and a good example of integrating the biology with the psychosocial phenomena in this case. So here's what happened with her. She had no sexual desire, and she felt like, I don't need any sexual desire. I'm an ascetic person who does not need pleasure. And she became a long-distance runner who competed in high school and college and saying, I can take self-punishment with a stoic attitude. Some of you may remember that Anna Freud developed the notion of a defense mechanism in adolescence called asceticism, you know, denial of any need or any pleasures, saying, I'm above that, as a way of fending off sexuality in adolescent development. She devoted the, her life to the care of two boys, her job, and self-improvement. But she continued to have that conviction that she was bad. And any aggression towards the parents was redirected towards the self. And, of course, the religious cultural factors in her childhood uh, reinforced the, this badness. One of the things you commonly see in a sexually abused child who then, as an adult, grows up, they, they live with an expectation that lightning will strike at any moment. And what I mean is, 
Many of these victims can't have positive self-expectations from relationships. They think, if I try to trust this person, something bad will happen. Lightning will strike. So they keep interpersonal distance. So, you know, as I said, she sits way at the end of my office, so I, she wouldn't be very close because it's safer, and, she, and I might be one of these people who would strike her. Now, the other thing she had, I think, is you see in other abuse victims, she tenaciously was clinging to suicidality as an escape hatch from the intolerable situation in childhood. She said this started when she would be floating above in the associated state. And here's what she would think. I don't need to be scared that father is there because an angel will come down from heaven and extend her arm and lift me out of the house and I will be safe. So she developed a fantasy life that was somehow reassuring to her. It was, again, a very heartbreaking story. So what are the treatment implications of this? Well, um, all of these things I'm saying are, you know, we have to treat disorders in isolation. We treat a person, we, we can't treat disorders in isolation. We treat a person with a disorder. And, you know, in my approach with this patient, I uh, encouraged her to continue the jogging. I helped her see that when somebody else treats you badly, it doesn't mean that you are bad. We spent a lot of time on that. And I also, I helped her contextualize the suicidal ideas. And I said, Nietzsche once said, the thought of suicide has carried me through many a dark night. And I told her, thinking about suicide can be adaptive for you. It can, it can tell you there is a way out. I am not trapped. That helped a lot because she <clears throat> understood that's why she held on to that, even though her life was going pretty well when I saw her. <clears throat> now, you know, she eventually got considerably uh, better, but of course the biological aspect did not change much in terms of her sexual response. But her husband was a loving man who was very tolerant of this. And the other thing I want to say about the treating disorders in isolation, when you're treating the person, you're a person also treating uh, the patient, and you have to take into account your own personal reactions and what you bring to it. We say now psychotherapy is involved with two patients in the room, not one. We both come with our own baggage collected over many years. And it's not simply a series of procedures, which is often the way it's uh, described today. Jonathan Shedler, an analytically oriented therapist, made a humorous, a humorous version of the Hippocrates quote. It's more important to know what sort of person treats a condition than to know what sort of treatment manual the person is following. So he's saying, you know, the person of the therapist will make a huge difference, not just your technique. <clears throat> the therapist effects is something that's understudied in psychotherapy research. And it's usually left out. But in the famous NIMH uh, depression study back in the 90s, um, Sid Blatt looked at all of the therapists and found that certain therapists had better outcomes than other therapists, even though they're doing the same manualized treatment because of the person they were. <clears throat> and the other, the other interesting thing that came out of the famous NIMH study in the 90s was this. The therapeutic relationship appears to be far more important than a specific technique in predicting outcome. And, and that's quite remarkable. I think we sort of know that in a way. But basically, as a, a summary of psychotherapy research, you'd have to say... The therapeutic relationship is the most powerful predictor of outcome, not what exactly you say or what the technique is. 
Now, in this in the study, what was so interesting in this 1990 study NIMH did, the therapeutic alliance accounted for more variance in outcome than any of the treatments themselves: CBT, interpersonal therapy, amipramine, or placebo. So the way the therapeutic relationship was formed is what predicted, e even with medication. I always tell the residents, don't separate out medication and therapy. They're inextricably linked when you're working with someone. There's another um, body of research that's starting to appear called therapist effects. And, and this term I, I put up here is being used in the literature Appropriate responsiveness. And what this means is a flexible therapist is likely to have a better outcome than a rigid therapist who says you must follow step one, two, three, and four. And trying to constantly adjust yourself to what the patient needs. And, and here, let the patient supervise you, as I said the other day in the famous Beyond quote. Kind of go where the patient needs to go. And that is good therapy, to be able to flexibly shift. But it does make it difficult to identify, you know, the interventions that create the effects in psychotherapy research, because it could be the person of the therapist that's having the strongest impact. Now, what, I'm going to close, and then we'll have time for discussion, with just a few questions that we ought to consider. Why is the person being ignored and neglected in contemporary psychiatry? I think a lot of it has to do with it takes a lot more effort and work. And busy clinicians may not want to get into who the person is because they have people in their waiting room that they're waiting for and they don't want to get into it. The other reason is I think that we all secretly hate complexity. And I'll tell you when you see this, it's when you're very busy and you're looking at your clock, and it says, you know, there are 15 minutes left in the session, and the patient will bring in a level of complexity that they had excluded, and a whole new area of the patient's life has to be considered. And there's a part of me, a part of all of you probably, say, oh, okay, all right, yeah, do we really have to figure this in? I'm, you know... <laughs> I've got to get out of here. And so there, there is a tendency for us to want to rush through some things. And the complexity makes it more difficult. And we have to slow down and supervise ourselves and say, wait a minute, I may need to get some of this today and some of the next appointment. We prefer simple reductive thinking. No one will admit that, but it's probably true that, you know, you think to yourself, this is an easy patient. Good. They've got a straightforward depression I can give them Lexapro and they'll be fine and whew, I can have some time to do some notes before the next patient comes, you know. Getting to know the person takes time. Time is money. Um, and there's a huge problem in the United States right now where there's such a pressure to do so much in a short time. The electronic medical record is driving everybody crazy. And, you know, one... Um, psychiatrist in a mental health clinic was in an audience like this and she raised her hand and she said, I, I have to ventilate about this. I have to see six patients in one hour. So that's 10 minutes per patient. And at the end of the 10 minutes, I have to have typed the note and written the prescription and given it to the patient. And I, I can't keep up. And then she also said that, you know, the, uh, the way the chairs were situated, the patients there, she said that she would be typing on the computer and not looking at the patient. She says, I can't even make eye contact with the patient because I have to type all of this stuff in the record. And, and she said, I feel bad about it, but uh, I just, there isn't time. And I thought, this is really dreadful if, you, if that patient isn't having that eye-to-eye -eye connection and is, you know, you're observing something in the nonverbal aspect of what, what the face tells you, but this is what is going on in the United States. And getting to know the person may be unsettling to the clinician. Back to the, the idea that we all like simple, 
reductive things and not complexity, it's often deeply disturbing if you listen to your patient. I was deeply disturbed to hear about this uh, 44-year-old woman's incest experience. And I knew I had to, but I would have liked to have changed the subject and not gotten into that. But I needed to do that to help her. And technology, of course, is, as I was talking about in my opening address, has a lot to do with why it's harder and harder to see the person and it's easier to see what's on the screen, what the lab values are, what the demographics are, and see that as a shortcut. But in many ways, the technology undermines that person-to-person -person therapeutic alliance, which is so critically important to outcome. Now, what can we do about all this? I'm not sure. I'm raising this as a major issue for all of us. Some of my thoughts are that, you know, if we bring back the person, it's really a way of thinking that you're not just getting symptoms. You're learning who this person is, and you're curious. You want to know the person. And there's, I think there's a, an important point in this that if we actually try to get to know the patient, that itself is therapeutic. Let the patient tell his or her story. Another very un unpleasant development is because of the time constraints on an appointment with the patient. The patient constantly gets interrupted. And there was a study that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association where they had um, a tape recorder in the room and the doctors were general practitioners or internists who came in and the average doctor interrupted the patient 12 seconds after the patient started telling the story. The patient wants to say, here's what happened to me. Then all of a sudden they're interrupted and do you have this symptom? Do you have that symptom? And the patient didn't have a chance to have the benefit of someone who really listens to the story and gets to know them. Nonverbal behavior tells you a great deal. We haven't talked too much about that, but that's a huge source of information in therapy. And as I've said to you before, let the patient supervise you. Follow the patient's leads. Um, I, I want to end with a wonderful quote by Kreppel in 1920. The affective and schizophrenic forms of mental illness do not represent the expression of particular pathological processes, but rather indicate the areas of our personality in which these processes unfold. I thought that was uh, extraordinary wisdom for 1920. Thank you very much for listening to this long lecture. I hope it was valuable in some way to you. <laughs>
tudo que ele passou na vida, todas as coisas horríveis que aconteceram, ou boas também, quer dizer, então tudo isso, sem achar que, que isso é uma mentira, ou é uma fantasia, como às vezes acontece. Não, mas isso não pode ter acontecido. Né? Isso eu ouvi várias vezes. Então, esse é um aspecto interessante, né? que é a negação né? Do, dos traumas do paciente. E, a, e não buscar na história do paciente a origem dos problemas que ele tem hoje. Né? Então, há um bloqueio. Né? E um outro aspecto que eu acho assim é um pouquinho mais sofisticado, que é o seguinte, é o, o terapeuta que tem uma, um certo conhecimento de, de, de psicoterapia e, e de, de autores da, psicanalíticos, muitas vezes o que ocorre é uma tendência nesses casos, de achar um caminho dentro de uma teoria, né? de uma teoria, seja lá quem for, não, tô, não vou falar nomes, né? porque não, acho que não são os autores que, que nessa, nessa hora estão atrapalhando, mas dependendo do autor, até isso pode acontecer. Né? A teoria kleiniana, no passado, ela foi, era conhecida como, enfim, a culpa era da criança, né? E a criança estava criando histórias e tal. Então, isso eu acho que é uma coisa interessante né, para levar em consideração também quando se trata de pacientes desse tipo. Assim, e qualquer paciente. Né? Na verdade, nós temos que individualizar qualquer paciente que, nos, que chega para a gente. Né? Mas parabéns. Thank you. Uh, I think your point is excellent about theory as a way of avoiding a connection with the patient's narrative and story. And theory allows us on a busy day to take shortcuts when, you know, ah, that's the Oedipus complex. I know what's going on. And, and we need to be better about listening to aspects of the patient's story that don't fit any theory. And we are, you know, at sea trying to relate what happened to events, and uh, we have to be able to allow ourselves to be surprised and not, not know everything and continue to get into the history over time. So th thank you very much for the compliment. Obrigada. Eu sou psiquiatra e trabalho com pacientes com dor crônica e diagnóstico de câncer também. E eu gostaria de escutar a sua maneira de lidar quando o paciente não aceita a si mesmo, sabendo que tem uma doença crônica, sabendo que ficou defeituoso e não uh, e acaba que isso faz com que o paciente um, não aceite as terapias propostas, tenha uma adesão ao tratamento pior, enfim. Uh, eu conheço essa situação por despondency. Não sei como seria a tradução aqui para português, mas uh, queria saber como o senhor aborda esse tipo de situação. Obrigada. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think that group of patients you were uh describing may be among the most difficult patients we see in psychiatry i have had very limited contact in my own practice with those uh, patients with chronic pain and other kinds of intense uh, psychosomatic problems and i i do not feel that i am expert enough to give you a good answer uh, i would rather Uh, acknowledge my uh, difficulty with that group. Not, I can't say that I've had a success with those people that would be helpful to you. I, I just find them difficult. And it's a very small portion, so I haven't had enough experience really to make an intelligent comment. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Obrigado. 
médica de família com especial interesse em saúde mental. Uh, Arthur Kleiman tem falado sobre a necessidade de nós uh, prestarmos mais atenção no cuidado como um ato moral. Eu acho que o senhor falou um pouco sobre isso na parte final da sua apresentação. Eu queria saber se o senhor concorda. I haven't read the paper by Kleiman, but uh, I certainly agree that there's a fundamental moral component of what we do. And I've devoted much of my life to working on ethics problems in the field. And I wrote a book on boundary violations. And there are all fo forms of unethical behavior that occur that don't involve what are the more obvious boundary violations, but there are moral failures to be able to listen to the patient's pain, empathize with it, and help think through with the patient what can be done about their situation. And I feel we as therapists have some moral obligation to be the, the person who will listen to something that no one else will listen to. We have to sit still, not be in a hurry, and try to process it with the patient. And that can be very helpful, even if we're not perfect in our view or our treatment plan, the act of listening and trying to be there with the person, you know, being, being with and witnessing what's going on. É, eu gostaria de compartilhar com, com o senhor uma, uma experiência, porque a sua conferência está muito sintônica com o que eu penso, né? assim, que seria, bom, uh, como é que nós podemos, né, assim, cada vez mais, é, influenciar essa integração me, mente servo pessoa doença né? E a gente, eu, eu trabalho também com a formação de, de psiquiatras, é uma residência, e parece que hoje, pelo menos, o nosso caminho poderia começar como que nós estamos formando o, o psiquiatra. Né? E jogamos ele nessa realidade que o senhor colocou nos Estados Unidos. Né? É, então, no, no nosso programa de, de psicoterapia analítica, né, nós tivemos uma experiência que eu acho que pode ser interessante. Primeiro, a, a, a ideia de psiquiatria de evidências nos atrapalha um pouco. Aqui no Brasil tem assim, a psiquiatria é de evidência. E, e a evidência é um sintoma. E quando eles chegam, eu até brinco com eles, dizendo assim, olha, a gente, a gente vai trabalhar com algo que é assim, a psiquiatria sem evidências porque nós precisamos descobrir algo que talvez não tenha tanta evidência como é posto. Primeira primeira recepção com eles. Depois nós estamos tendo uma experiência interessante, que é que entre eles, eles possam ter atendimentos mais frequentes durante a semana com o paciente e outra. Eles se distribuem, assim, um medica e o outro não medica, entre eles. Então, é interessante o psiquiatra ter uma, uma visão de um paciente que ele não vai poder medicar. Ele vai absolutamente só escutar e vai poder discutir com o um colega sobre a medicação. Isso tem trazido uma experiência interessante porque é, cria um conflito dentro do, do, do residente, né, que a gente tem que trabalhar muito sobre essas questões da, da, da mente, né? vamos, vamos supor, nesse sentido. Então, é Lá pelas tantas, a gente vai tentando fazer essa integração que o senhor está propondo, da qual eu concordo plenamente. Não é assim? Quando eles vêm dizer, ah, isso aqui é um transtorno de personalidade. Eu digo, quem sabe que tu pensa que isso aí é a personalidade da pessoa? E a gente pode começar a trabalhar em cima disso. Então, são coisas que eu queria lhe escutar, porque realmente a gente precisa, digamos, intervir um pouco nisso, para quem sabe minimizar esse dano que o senhor descreveu lá o que acontece nos Estados Unidos. We, um, I'll try to give a brief uh, response. I mean, you've said many different things that are important, but um, I think it begins in the training system, where you 
you don't compartmentalize the patient into a brain on the one hand and a mind on the other. It's like in the way that a non-psychiatric physician says, would you go into room 432 and see the person with the shoulder? It's like taking a body part and compartmentalizing it. We have to make a point when we teach that you're always integrating mind, brain, and culture into uh, as factors that are alive in each patient. We can't always spend as much time, but there has to be a philosophy of the whole person. And when we get to evidence-based treatments, uh, they're often more reductive than that. They're focusing in on a particular symptom rather than seeing the person with all of those different uh, influences. And I think when we teach trainees, we have to illustrate how we take all of the person into account in, you know, a, in a, a brevi an abbreviated way. We can't talk about everything, but constantly modeling that sort of uh, biopsychosocial treatment. That's the best of psychiatry. Vou pedir para que as perguntas sejam breves. Professor Flávio, chances? Gaba, não é uma pergunta, eu, na realidade é um, é um agradecimento. Primeira vez que eu lhe vi foi aqui, há 20 anos, e eu estava terminando a residência. Eu, nós dois envelhecemos né, nesses últimos 20 anos. Não. É só para Little bit. E eu quero lhe dizer que eu já lhe ouvi aqui e muitas vezes em congressos da Associação Americana de Psiquiatria também. E lhe ouvia como ouvia uma música clássica maravilhosa. Cada vez é um, é um som muito lindo. Ter aprendido psiquiatria com os professores no seu livro aqui na residência do Hospital de, Clínicos, de Clínicas foi algo transformador. A sua, o seu conceito de um psiquiatra clínico dinamicamente orientado, ele transformou muita, muitos de nós de uma geração que hoje tem 20, 25 anos de profissão. Então, eu quero, em nome dessa geração, profundamente agradecer a sua influência enorme sobre uma geração de psiquiatras aqui. E, e sempre dizer que lhe ouvi essa música que toca o coração. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say I'm uh, very moved by what you said, and uh, it means a great deal to me that you have benefited from the teaching and the books. And, you know, writing a textbook is very tedious, and you hope as an author that somebody will read it and feel that it's helped them treat patients. So what you say is like music to my ears. So thank you very much. É, eu tenho uma pergunta. Como, é, o senhor pode escolher responder ou não responder. É... <laughs> É, como pessoa, paciente e terapeuta, eu tenho a curiosidade de saber com que frequência o senhor vê o seu terapeuta. Ou via. Oh, I, I don't mind telling you. I think it's valuable to have your own treatment. And uh, I had uh, a training analysis. And then later I went back to a different analyst and we used to say in psychoanalytic training you do one analysis for the institute and one for yourself so <laughs> i did one for myself because i felt i had problems with patients in a certain way where i would not see things and i would uh 
I try, I tried to get a better sense of my own self and my own person and what things I would exclude and what things I would include in my formulations. It was very, very helpful. And so I, I highly recommend that we should avail ourselves of treatment periodically throughout our lives. And the same applies to consultation. Don't try to do it all by yourself. Talk to a consultant. And I don't mention the name of the patient. The consultant doesn't know who I'm talking about. Preserve confidentiality. And I get help from others. What? Oh, sure. Even nowadays. Yeah. Even uh, older <laughs> therapists have trouble. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so we need help. <laughs> Meu nome, meu nome é Rogério Lerner, de São Paulo. É, gostaria de saber é, se o senhor poderia comentar um pouco sobre é, a importância da sua formação cultural, é, do seu apreço pelas artes, como isso comparece no seu trabalho, em especial as artes dramáticas. Uh, well, it's certainly relevant because... Uh, my mother was a professional actress, and she also wrote a, a Freudian um, understanding of Harold Pinter's dramas. My, my dad was a director of theater, so as a child, I went to rehearsal with my father, and I would see all of these dramas on the stage, and I have no doubt that this brought to me, a sense of conflict in families. What, you know, what was going on on stage by an Arthur Miller play, you know, or uh, other uh, Shakespeare, you see a lot about human functioning and human despair. So I think that shaped an interest for me that was very much uh, uh, shown in my, like I've written books about psychiatry and the cinema and how the films portray what we do, and I wrote a book on the miniseries, The Sopranos, and how the antisocial elements of the, anti, of the uh, mafia played into the psychology of the entire show. So that, that's always something that immediately captures my interest because it's a way of reviving something from my childhood and my family of origin and trying to work out something, you know, in my mind. So... I certainly see that every week, you know, in one way or another. Bom, nós temos mais alguns minutos. Eu vou aproveitar, Dr. Gabbard, fazer uma pergunta sobre o que nós estávamos conversando. E se alguém quiser, talvez, se candidatar para mais uma <risos> última pergunta. Uh, no nosso campo que nós trabalhamos, no campo das adições, nós uh, enfrentamos muito essa problemática, inclusive teórica, de um lado que fala sobre uma brain disease, uma doença do cérebro, que o, o, o indivíduo está cometido por ela, e eu, do outro lado alguns autores que falam em choice disorder, uma, uma, um transtorno das escolhas que levam, então, uh, relacionados ao self, essa sensação de ter um livre-arbítrio, a escolher as suas ações. O senhor comentou isso na sua palestra inicial também sobre a influência do narcisismo em, em, nos transtornos comportamentais aditivos. Eu gostaria de lhe ouvir sobre isso. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is a good question because um, the way that substance abuse problems are dealt with is often through uh, a, a form of reductionism, that there is something in the brain that is triggered by an outside agent that is addictive, and therefore we treat at the level of the brain, and the person isn't involved. It's almost, in the worst situation, it's like, um, I, I, the person, didn't take a pill. My brain made me do it. A kind of 
splitting of brain and person that is a problem. Even though I'm all in favor of finding agents that are helpful for addictions, but uh, it's a problem because so many psychosocial factors can influence whether someone chooses to keep using the drug or stop it. And that part, I think, gets understated with the excitement of new developments in brain research. Concordo plenamente. Temos mais um tempo para mais uma pergunta? <coughs> Professor Marcelo. Em primeiro lugar, gostaria de cumprimentar novamente a brilhante conferência e eu gostaria de lhe ouvir, se o senhor puder fazer alguns comentários sobre uh, um modelo, modelos, a disponibilidade de modelos integradores em psiquiatria, modelos teóricos que, que, que integrem né, esses diferentes aspectos da psiquiatria. E um dos modelos que eu tenho lido, enfim, que, me, que acho que, que é bastante interessante e útil, útil, é o modelo de perspectivas em psiquiatria proposto por Mark Hugh Slavny nos anos 80, uh, que é o modelo das perspectivas, né? Eu, eu, a minha pergunta é, primeiro, se o senhor conhece esse modelo, enfim, e o que, que o senhor acha desse modelo em termos de ensino para residência, enfim, ensino da psiquiatria uh, servir como um, um modelo teórico integrador? I don't personally know that model well enough to comment intelligently on it, but I certainly agree that the real challenge in teaching today is looking at perspectives from mind and brain and culture and trying to demonstrate with patients how you would integrate all of the aspects of the biopsychosocial illness. Um, and one of the problems is there is not a cookbook that says do A, B, C, D, E. You have to be improvising creatively to bring in all those different elements. So that's one of our great challenges, but I think it's one we cannot ignore. We can't do partial psychiatry. We have to see the person and the illness and the brain and the culture and uh, all the other influences. So uh, we all struggle to find a good model for that. Marcelo, Marcelo queres comentar um pouco sobre o modelo das perspectivas rapidamente? <coughs> Para, para ele poder entender. Uh, é, o, 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 o livro do, do Mark Hugh, né, é, que é Perspectivas em Psiquiatria, ele con considera que o grande dilema da psiquiatria é a, integra a integração entre mente e e cérebro, né? que isso é o, é o dilema central da, da psiquiatria como especialidade. Então, ele propõe que, que, a, que, o, que o paciente deveria ser visto uh, sob diferentes perspectivas. Então, existiria a perspectiva da doença, a perspectiva de dimensional, a, a perspectiva de comportamento e a perspectiva de história de vida, a narrativa, né? que seria a, 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 a perspectiva inicial e central dentro da psiquiatria. É, uma, é um modelo bastante interessante, né? e eu acho que ele é, ele é didático e extremamente atual. Ele é um modelo dos anos 80, mas eu acho que ele segue ainda sendo, do que eu tenho lido e tentado encontrar alternativas, ainda segue um modelo pragmático, num certo sentido, e útil para ensinar e estar tá atento aos diferentes aspectos do paciente. As I say, I know a little bit about it, and it looks like it uh, it does make sense. I just don't have experience using the model in a way that I could make a coherent presentation of it. Bom, em função do tempo, eu gostaria mais uma vez de agradecer agora os seus comentários, sempre muito sensíveis, muito humildes, e pedir uma, mais uma salva de aplausos aí para... Thank you.